Good morning, Saints of First Church. It is a joy to see you in worship on this first Sunday after Christmas, also known as New Year's Eve. We're glad that all of you are here, especially those who are visiting with us. We ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your road, we might have a record of your attendance with us on this Lord's Day. We appreciate it. We're thrilled when you're with us in worship. I want to share with you a few announcements. Some are contained on the Opportunities page, and there are some other ones as well. I want to remind you that you have another opportunity, one more opportunity, to contribute to the Beacon District Christmas offering. If you feel so there, there's information here about the offering itself. We appreciate your support. I want to remind you that the church office is closed tomorrow in observance of New Year's. It'll be back uh, to normal operating hours on Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, we resume our suppers at 5.30, so please uh, note that. And if you haven't signed up yet, there's a, there's a way for you to do that. You see that information there. Um, we want to remind you that following worship today, you're invited to come and take uh, Poinsettia home with you. Uh, this will be the last day they'll be with us in worship, and after the service is over, you're invited to come and take a Poinsettia home with you. So we hope you'll do that. Uh, also, those of you who have been asking about the offering envelopes, they are here. They're out in the hallway near the office, and you're invited to, after service, go pick yours up. And we thank you for, for doing that. Uh, are there other announcements that need to be made this time? Drew, you got something to announce. This Thursday at 6 o'clock in Asbury Conference Room, the Children's Miss and Youth Council will meet. If I can get as many uplift parents there as possible, we'll talk about the vision trip. Some of you talk to people. Right. Be there this way. <laughs> he said that this morning. I thought that was one of the be there, be square was one of those old timey sayings. Made me feel rather nostalgic. Very appropriate for the end of the year, don't you think? We are thrilled that you're with us in worship this day. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I wonder as I wander out under the sky How Jesus the Savior did come for to die For poor ornery people like you and like I I wonder as I wander out under the sky when mary birthed jesus twas in a cow stall with wise men and farmers and shepherds and all when high from god's heaven a star's light did fall and the promise of ages it then did recall. If Jesus had wanted for any we thing, a star in the sky or a bird on the wing, or all of God's angels in heaven for to sing. He surely could have it, for he was the king. I wonder as I wander out under the sky, how Jesus the Savior did come for to die. For poor hungry people like you and like I. I wonder as I wander out under the sky.
I invite you now to stand as you're able as we join together in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletins. Praise the Lord from the heavens and the earth. Praise God who commanded all creation. God has raised up from the people. Praise the Lord. Let's join now in the opening prayer. God of promise and light, open our eyes this morning that we may see your light in the darkness. Open our hearts that we may perceive your promises of salvation and righteousness fulfilled in the babe of Bethlehem. May this time of worship bring us closer to you, that the good news of the birth of your light and love will transform our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 249 in the hymnal. 249, there's a song in the air. join together in our Psalter, as you find it printed in the, in the hymnal number 861. It's Psalm 148, and we'll be using the musical response. From the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord, all his angels. Praise the Lord, all his saints. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise the Lord, all shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded and they were created. Who established them forever and ever and fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps.
Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Beasts of all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Young men and ladies together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, whose glory is above the earth and heaven. God is the Lord. God's family gathered together in God's house, let us turn and exchange signs of his love and peace with one another. Maybe seated. It's now time for the children to come forward. We'll have a little time with the young disciples. I see a few kids back there. And I want you to meet me over here. Can you come on over here? We're going to go over here where the, where the wise men are, the magi. They've been traveling from way back there all the way over to here. And, we're, we're, and I have three of you, so I want you to... Um, three young wise women to grab three wise men. Can you come get the wise man? You can help her, sure. There you go. All right. Now, let's bring them. Hold on. They can't arrive till next Sunday because that's what we call Epiphany Sunday. Ooh, it's kind of hot there. You think they'll be okay? You know, that sort of is like the, the heat of the desert because they've traveled through the desert Boy, it feels great here, too. <laughs> but, um, it's a dry heat. Hi, Rebecca. You can put your wise man right there. Now, I want you to th think about something. And, of course, they're all heading in that direction. What have they been following? What has been guiding them all this long way? The star. God had a star in the sky that they've been following. Now, if you read in the Gospel of Matthew that tells about the wise men and the star that God put in the sky. It's interesting, when they finally arrived in Jerusalem and met with King Herod, it seems like he didn't know anything about a star or anything else unusual. Sometimes if you see a cartoon or a movie about the birth of Jesus, you see this gigantic star, kind of like a comet in the sky, and it goes across. And I wonder if maybe it wasn't like that, at least not at first, but maybe something a little bit more ordinary 
that only the wise men that studied the stars might have noticed. One idea is called a conjunction. Can you say that's a big word? Conjunction. What that is, is if two planets or a star and a planet get real close together, at least look as you look up in the, in the sky, their light can get very, very bright when it comes together because our atmosphere makes the light look even brighter. Now, at the time of Jesus' birth, there was a near conjunction of Jupiter and Venus, the planet of the kings, the planet of love. They came nearly together. The wise men might have seen that and started their journey following the planet Venus as it moved westward. And maybe, who knows, it took six months, but who knows, maybe when they reached Jerusalem, that near conjunction they saw here became a perfect conjunction there. And they said, oh my goodness, look at that star now. It's even more glorious and amazing than it was before. And they would have known the significance, whereas maybe King Herod wouldn't. Now, think about that journey. Think about that journey through the desert for a long ways. If they came from Persia, you know, that would have been a, a thousand miles. A thousand miles on camels. Do you think maybe they might have gotten a little discouraged? If the star was this great big bright star you could see, obviously, they wouldn't have gotten discouraged. There's the star, there's the star. But what if it was just a conjunction and it wasn't quite so obvious? Think about, think about life. It's like a journey. Y'all are starting out in life. Yeah, you're young. I'm, I'm at the other end. See, I'm old. I'm at the other end of life. Life is a journey. Hopefully a journey when we are trying to follow the light of Jesus. And sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes it's not so easy to follow that star of Jesus' light. Now next week, we're going to have the wise men arrive at the manger. Okay, so they've got some, they got to really get to do some, some walking, get those camels going. Let's have a little prayer together. You, you pray after me. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For calling us. For calling us. To be on a journey. To be on a journey. A journey of faith. A journey of faith. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard. But your light. But your light. Guides us the whole way. Guides us the whole way. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we know the wise men are warm. It's a dry heat, so don't worry about that. Grateful for the many prayers that have been answered, mindful of prayers that have yet to be answered, and, and knowledgeable that we serve a Lord who hears and answers our prayers. We come now to our time of prayers. Uh, we begin by sharing our joys and concerns, then we'll have a time of silent prayer. I'll pray a pastoral prayer, and we'll conclude our prayer time by praying together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Are there joys or concerns you'd like to share? Yes, Jeff. Hi, Joy. My name is Jeff. I'm relatively new to the church. I'm very proud to have my favorite oldest daughter, Evan, and my favorite youngest daughter, Addison, with us today. <laughs> You're a proud father, Jeff. We're, 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 we're proud of you for being a proud father. That's a good thing. Welcome, ladies. We're glad you're with us. Other oh, joys, yes, our concerns. Yes, ma'am. I have a concern. Uh, prayers for John Morgan, who has suffered a slight heart attack. Right. He's at home, from what I understand. We're praying for John Morgan, uh, who's apparently suffered a slight heart attack in his home. It's recuperating. But we want to remember him in our, in our prayers as he goes through that time of recovery. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Others? We want to remember the family of George Freeman. Uh, we found out that his daughter passed away as well, so we want to lift her up in prayers. Are there any unspoken requests we would indicate with the lifting of a hand? And God sees your hand. He knows your requests. 
this time, let us go to the Lord in a spirit of prayer. We'll begin with a time of silent prayer. Then I'll pray a pastoral prayer. We'll conclude our prayer time by praying the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have made every living thing to praise you. Now in these latter days, we whom you have called to be the crown of your creation come before you to join our voices with the angels in singing glory to your holy name. In the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten Son, born under the law, that we might be redeemed. In this act of self-giving, you have also put your spirit into our hearts. In this way, we know ourselves to be freed from slavery and made your children, but we have not always lived like heirs. We still choose the old ways and wander far from our calling. Have mercy upon us, O God, and bring us back. As you filled Simeon with the spirit to proclaim that your salvation had come, Fill us anew with that same spirit so that we too may tell the world that you have come to dwell among us. Empower your church to proclaim Christ as Lord and Savior. In these days of joy when we celebrate his coming for us, help us to remember that he came also to those who are absent from us this day. Be especially close to those who are in places of care where they cannot care for themselves. Give rest to those broken in body, soul, or spirit. Give hope to those who are in despair. Surround everyone with your gift of peace. Hear us, O loving God, for we are bold to pray all of this in the name of of the babe of Bethlehem, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray to you by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'll invite our ushers to come forward and ask you to give as unto the Lord.
Gracious and loving God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we give you thanks for the many blessings of this life, especially in this season we give you thanks for Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who came to give us life abundant and eternal. We ask God now that you receive this only a small portion of all that you have entrusted to our care, and we ask God that you would use our gifts and use us for the furtherance of your kingdom in Washington, Bath, Bellhaven, Chocowinity, Beaufort County, and beyond, even unto the ends of the earth. We pray this in your name. Amen. Remain standing, if you will, as we join together in another hymn, number 250 in your hymnals, Once in Royal David City. <clears throat>
You may be seated. He is born the holy child. Play the oboe and bagpipes merrily. He is born the holy child. Sing we all of the Savior mild. Through long ages of the past, prophets have foretold his coming. Through long ages of the past, now the time has come at last. He is born the holy child. Play the oboe and bagpipes merrily. He is born the holy child. Sing we all of the Savior mild. Oh, how lovely, oh, how pure is this perfect child of heaven. Oh, how lovely, oh, how pure, gracious gift to humankind. He is born the holy child, play the oboe and bagpipes merrily. He is born the holy child, sing we now of the Savior mild. Jesus, Lord of all the world, coming as a child among us. Jesus, Lord of all the world, grant to us thy heavenly peace. He is born the holy child, play the oboe and bagpipes merrily. He is born the holy child, sing we all of the Savior mild. Say what the memory holds on to. I remember learning the words of the chorus of that song in French class years ago. <laughs> and uh, we want to thank the Reverend Dr. Charles Michael Smith for sharing his music with us this morning. Before I knew of First Church in Washington, uh, I had the privilege of being blessed on many occasions by hearing him sing, and it blesses my heart to know that uh, that that desire and that gift was planted and nurtured here first. And so, thank you for sharing that with us. Our text for this day comes to us from the second chapter of, chapter of Luke's Gospel. It's sort of a, a continuation from last Sunday evening. We're looking at verses 22 through 40. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn there. Uh, if uh, you want to use the Pew Bible in front of you, I encourage you to do that as well. And uh, we'll be reading verses 22 to 40, and I invite you now to give ear to the reading of God's Word. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light 
for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to thy people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed." And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and a widow till she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and prayer day and night. And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke to him to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God and the house of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks once more for the opportunity to break together the bread of life. We ask God that you would allow your word and your presence to nourish us even unto everlasting life. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. I was sitting over last Sunday evening, 5 o'clock in Wesley Hall, for our children's production. Holy chaos. But you love it. It's wonderful. And there was a point we were singing and the words became more than words and they came off of the screen and it overwhelmed me. The good news of Christmas, what it really means. The victory that is already ours. And that was a powerful and a good feeling. And one I don't think we need to leave when all of the poinsettias are taken out away from the, the, the chancel rail. Joe Carr talks about seeing a Christmas play pretty much like we had uh, one time. She, she was watching. The little kids came up the front of the church. They did the, the production, you know, with the... The, the bathrobes and the towels over the head, you know, and the wise men with the painted box, the whole thing, you know. And they did a good job, and the congregation gave them a round of applause. And then the actors departed and went to the back of the church, starting with the uh, wise men, and then the shepherds, and then the angels, and then Joseph, and last but not least, Mary left. Well, little Mary got about halfway up the road, the center aisle, and she stopped on a dime, turned around, and ran back into the front of the church and was bent over the manger. And everybody was thinking, what in the world's wrong? Well, pretty soon it became very clear what had happened. Mary had forgotten the baby Jesus. So she immediately reached over into the manger, grabbed Jesus, the little doll that they'd used for Jesus, and clutched him under her arm and began to march back up the aisle. Bless her heart, she did do the right thing. She forgot, but she came back. She remembered. As we prepare to leave this Christmas season, we have the opportunity once more to clutch the baby Jesus ourselves, to grasp tightly the true message of Christmas. As we reflect on the words that we have just shared together from Luke's gospel, my prayer is that we will come to know that this truth of Christmas, this miracle, is not just some empty promise spoken to us by a dead book. It is an assurance that is backed by the very presence of God himself. This morning, we give thanks as God's people to know that we Serve a God who keeps his promises. 
We serve a God who keeps His promises. Mary and Joseph were very devout Jews who took their faith very seriously. And as the text reminds us, on the eighth day, they went back to the temple in Jerusalem, as was the custom, to offer a sacrifice not only for purification, but also a sacrifice of thanksgiving for a firstborn son. That was the custom, and they were following the custom. And as they did, as they entered the temple complex, they met a man named Simeon. Simeon also was a very devout believer who frequented the temple very often, and not just because he liked the good singing and the good preaching. He came because he had received a promise from God that he would not leave this world until he had laid eyes on the fulfillment of God's promise, the coming of the Messiah. As the text tells us, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And on that day in particular, the Holy Spirit quickened his spirit and said, Simeon, you've got to get over to the temple. You ever had that experience before? You ever had that experience when you are sitting there and all of a sudden you just feel, I've got to go somewhere. I've got to do, I've got to do this thing. I've, I've got to, I don't know why, I've got to do it. That's what's going on with Simeon. He goes to temple. And as he's standing there, he sees the young couple come through the door, Mary and Joseph, and, he, and they have the baby. And immediately the Holy Spirit speaks to him again. That's who you're looking for. And he goes over and he makes an interesting request. Can I hold the baby? Can you imagine somebody coming up to you, a stranger out of the blue, saying, can I, can I hold your baby? What would you think? Well, it must have been a God thing because Mary, sure. And Simeon took this precious child in his hands and immediately, the Holy Spirit agreed with his spirit. This is the kid you have been waiting your whole life to put your eyes on. And Simeon's holding this child and he breaks out into a song. We know it in the church as the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, now you can let your servant depart in peace according to your word because my eyes have seen your salvation. He's giving thanks to God for this day and for the fact that God has fulfilled the promise. His life is never going to be the same after this because he now has proof that we follow a God who keeps his word to an elderly man, to God's people, and to the whole world. You know, this idea of promise keeping really doesn't have a real stellar track record in our culture, does it? There's a story told about two men who went to a rally to hear a politician to speak. About midway through the speech, the first guy spoke up and said to his friend, don't listen to that man, he's lying. Everything he's saying, I know he's lying. The second fellow said, well, how do you know he's lying? The first guy said, it's easy, his lips are moving. I don't want to be real hard on politicians because the truth of the matter is in our day and time there are people from all vocations, from all walks of life who play fast and loose with credibility to the point that it's made us jaded to the idea that somebody would actually make a promise and keep it. And yet, we may not want to admit it, but deep down inside there is a hunger and an aching and a longing in every human being to know that whoever is in control is a being of integrity who will keep his word. All of us deep down inside, whether we want to admit it or not, we long to know and to have people in our lives who are people of integrity, who will do what they say, who will keep their word. It's important to us. Years ago, there was a, a commercial, uh, an ad for an insurance company. It showed a daddy and his little girl, and the caption underneath the ad said, the promise to attend recitals, notwithstanding, the promise of staying away from her when she's with her friends at the mall, the promise to keep everything safe. Nothing binds us more one to another than the fact of a promise kept. K 
kept promises are important to us. And what's true for a daddy and his little girl is even more important for God and his people. And the wonder of Christmas, part of the blessing of the miracle is knowing that this miracle is representative to us that we are following a God who does what he says and says what he means to do. Our God keeps his promises. And that's good news. We also have to acknowledge, though, the truth that God does not promise us a rose garden. God doesn't promise us a rose garden. We have Simeon in the text standing there, and he's holding this child, and you can imagine there are probably tears streaming down his cheeks. And he turns to Mary and Joseph and he, he offers a blessing to them. And it's a sweet scene. And if it cuts there, it's a treasure that will be remembered forever. But Simeon doesn't stop there, does he? He then turns and he says, this boy's going to cause some things to happen. And he says to Mary, a sword is going to pierce your soul. Now what in the world does he mean by that? That doesn't fit into silent night. That doesn't fit into joy to the world. What does that mean? It means there's some more stuff here than what meets the eye. There's a story told about a Christmas pageant that was held in a maximum security prison. Some of the inmates had agreed that they would perform the nativity play for the other inmates. But because it was a maximum security facility, nothing could be allowed inside, so whatever they needed to perform the play, they had to get inside the prison. So they became very creative. Somebody found a mop head that they used for the long hair of Mary. Somebody began to glue cotton balls onto a hat to represent sheep. The guys even found a cardboard box they could use for the manger, but they couldn't figure out what they would use as a stand-in for the baby Jesus. Somebody suggested we could just use the empty blankets. No, that wouldn't work. That's not, we've got to have something more than that. And so they, they're going back and forth. They haven't made a decision. And finally, on the day of the play, the chaplain came to the cast and said, I've got the perfect item. And so the show went on. It was very well received. The inmates enjoyed it. The, the cast got a particular meaning out of performing the play. It meant very much to them. And then the great time came for the revelation of what had stood in for the baby Jesus. And the blanket was opened up, and to the amazement of everybody there, they saw that the stand-in the, for the baby Jesus was the cross from the chaplain's office. In that instant, in that least likely place in all the world, the gospel message came to life. What better ending, or more accurately, what more precise and accurate and true ending to the Christmas story could there be than the cross in the cradle? You see, that's what it's all about. God keeps his promises, yes, but he doesn't promise us a rose garden. Certainly Jesus' life never took him through a rose garden. From the very beginning, his life is overshadowed by the cross. Whether it's the madness of King Herod, whether it's the stubbornness of the religious establishment to refuse to recognize who he is, or whether it's the windswept hill called Golgotha, Jesus' mission is before him from the very beginning. He understands that he has come to live in order to die, that you and I might live. He has come to submit his will to the will of God. That's a powerful example to those of us who dare to call ourselves his disciples. Because from the very moment you and I kneel at the cross to receive the gift of the cradle, we too are called to die to self in order to live to God. To submit our will 
to the will of God. Some of you may be shocked to look into the manger this morning and see the cross. But you have to understand that authentic Christian faith must never be confused with wearing rose-colored glasses. The cross in the cradle is the message. You know, you have to feel for the Holy Family. As they go further into the temple, they have to be thinking, what in the world is going to happen next? First it was this dusty manger, and then it was angels, and then it was a group of shepherds who came, and then this sweet little man takes our baby and blesses us and then gives us that heartbreaking prophecy. What in the world's next? Well, next is a lady named Anna, another devout believer, who immediately, when she sees him, knows what's going on, and she sees this baby, and she knows, here's the one. Here's the one, and she thanks God, and she doesn't stop there. She shares that news with everybody around her, as the Scripture tells us, for all those who are looking for the consolation of Israel. She understood that this gift is not just for you. It's a gift you're supposed to share with everybody around you. Because your life is different, you have to share it so others' lives can be changed and be different as well. John Aldrich was raised in a home where his mother was a social worker. And one of the things she always did at Christmas time was she would gather some things, some gifts for some unfortunate families. And she would go out and share those gifts. And one time she took John with her. And they went to a home that had two little boys. And among the many gifts that, that Miss Aldrich had gotten together, she had gotten an airplane, a toy airplane, that John said, you know, I really like that airplane. I kind of wanted to keep that airplane for myself. He said, but then I saw those two little boys playing with that airplane in that home. And he said, I thought to myself, even at that early age, I thought, well, I'm kind of glad they got that. That's a good thing. They can go ahead and keep that. I hope they enjoy that. He said, years later, I found out what became of those two little boys. One of the boys became a commercial airline pilot, flying 747s. The other boy was a military flight instructor. John said, you know, I'd like to think that that gift they received on that Christmas was a factor in determining what they did with their lives. The same is true of us. This gift that we have received in the babe of Bethlehem, I'd kind of like to think, I think God would kind of like to think that it has a determining factor in what we're going to do with our lives. This gift has changed us. And it's a gift we ought to share with everybody around us, right? Like the little girl in, in Joe's play, there are times when we walk off from this season of Christmas and forget Jesus, the baby Jesus. But it's not too late to remember. As we prepare to leave this Christmas and live in anticipation of the next Christmas, God give us the grace to understand that this gift we've received is a sign that we serve a God that keeps his word. And while being a follower of this God is not easy, it is possible through his grace. And this is a gift that we ought to be willing and eager to share all year round and all life long. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of going forth this morning is hymn number 251 in your hymnals. 251, go tell it on the mountain. Let us stand and sing to the glory of God.
God bless you. I love you. I want you to have a wonderful week. Well, I guess I'll see you next year. <laughs> Until we are together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.